to say something. All right, welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm your host, Susan Hobson, and Rob is on vacation today. So we've got a very special lineup of special guest co-hosts. Happen to be my favorite teammates on the planet, my dream team uh, that happen to be ex-hockey players like me, the best high-performance leadership experts on the planet. We got MJ, we got Taylor, we got Lauren all in the house in studio today. It's so good to see you girls sitting around me. And we are here to have a very important conversation and discussion about all this crazy Hockey Canada drama that has been brewing here north of the border over the last week. So let's get this party started. I know we got a lot to say on this issue. In fact, we had to sit on this one for at least a week so we could just simmer down a little bit. This one hits really close to home for all of us. We are all career hockey players. We grew up in the system. We basically, we skate better than we walk, right girls? So, <laughs> and as leadership 2.0 experts, I kind of feel like, yeah, we have a lot to say about this whole thing, don't we ladies? So it came out over the last week that um, since the year 1989, Hockey Canada has been using money from its special equity fund, it's called. Ironically. Um, ironically, yes. exactly what I was thinking, um, to pay off victims of sexual harassment cases. And these were victims um, that came forth and basically reported incidents involving some of, most notably, some of our uh, world junior hockey uh, boys playing on the world junior team in 2003 and 2018. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we want to open up this discussion right now to uh, the rest of my, my coaches here on my bench today, because yeah, what do we, what do we think about this whole issue, ladies? And what do we think the real core issue is underneath everything that we're hearing about and reading about out there in the news right now? Who wants to step up to the mic first? Come on, Lou. I know you got one. I was about to say, I see I'm the only one who's who's off mute. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, Taylor and I, Taylor and I talked about this at length on on our podcast as well. And I think one of the biggest things that I struggle with and that I'm sure all of us are struggling with is is the fact that this kind of behavior is learned. And it's mm -hmm. empowered through the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think I, I, on one of our podcasts, I even said, you know, it makes you want to go up to these kids' parents and say, what the heck? But it's not the parents. Mm -hmm. Their parents are probably great people. It's where they're learning it from. And the mm -hmm. leadership that exists within the community of hockey right now encourages this kind of behavior, whether consciously or subconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really frustrating to see because... You know, like you said, Susan, these, these elite level hockey players are heroes to kids mm -hmm. and their behavior is inexcusable. It's totally incongruent with the archetype of a hero, shall we say? Yes. Yeah. I think there's a bunch of different aspects to this problem that I really want to speak on. I obviously feel very passionate about, um, Never mind just what's going on in the hockey world, but just sexual harassment and workplace bullying. And like, these are all topics that Rob and I are interviewing top leadership experts every week on this program about, right? Because yeah, I think as we're looking at this great resignation thing that's happening uh, over the last year here, we know the number one driver of that is the toxic work culture, right? Like that ranks higher than even financial compensation. So we know that a toxic work culture or a culture of silence, like we're seeing, has really been the thing that's been exposed in all of what's come out in the media this last week. Um, yeah, we know that that's not just something that's happening in big business. In fact, we know that this is something that has been going on in sports 
for a very long time. It's just that nobody has ever been talking about it. So why haven't we been talking about it, ladies? Why is this? And now we'll go back to the hockey world because that's obviously contextually what we're talking about today. But how does that culture of silence perpetuate for as long as it has? I mean, the first reported sexual harassment case was in 1989. 21 victims later here in 2022, almost $10 million later, $10 million from this equity fund, which apparently was assembled using the money of the children's registration fees from Hockey Canada, right? From, from coast to coast across Canada. So my question is, and we know this is not just hockey, right? We know this goes on. We saw cases coming out in, uh, in gymnastics recently, right? And during the Olympics, we, we saw some stories coming out around that. We know that there's big NFL football players getting paid $200 million contracts, right? That are not being, you know, held accountable for their sexual uh, accusations and abuse. So yeah, my question is, how does this type of silence perpetuate that long? Why is it still like this in 2022? I think it really comes back to the fear of speaking up in the first place, right? I mean, like you said, this isn't just a hockey Canada or a, a hockey thing. It's in it's in other, uh, in other sports as well. But if you look at um, who was it that came forward from Chicago Blackhawks about the video coach uh, who was sexually abusing him, right? Like mm -hmm. it, the reason people stay silent is because fear of the repercussions of what can happen for them within their career, mm -hmm. right? Like what what is it that this coach will or will not allow me to do or whoever it is that you're talking about in this situation that, you know, how is this going to affect me if I speak up about it, if I start to talk about this, or if I call somebody out for their mistreatment and their malfeasance? Yeah. So the first thing that we see as a major player in creating a culture of silence and perpetuating it for this damn long, even though we're in a time and a space in the world where we're all talking about just how unacceptable these types of toxic cultures are. Um, but I think that's what we all know, right? Because we grew up in, in this sport specifically, but we grew up in sports, right? So we know that that coach carries a lot of power, right? Like there's a lot of power because they're, they have the, the ability to determine your ice time, who you're going to get, you know, recruited by or recommended to and right. Like we know that that's the number one reason why we haven't spoken up in terms of some of the things that we've experienced along the way in our hockey careers, right. Is because we were afraid that we would be punished. Well, Which look is at this from the leadership role, right? Like if, if it's the leaders who have been covering up for these young athletes who have been you know, perpetuating the violence in the first place, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are scared of what their reputation is going to look like, right? Like, what is this? How is this going to affect me and my job and my position here as like CEO of Hockey Canada, for example, right? The mm -hmm. one who was, who was refusing to step down after allowing this to, to continue on for so long. Mm -hmm. And we're going to definitely get into that in a second, Taylor. Thank you for reminding me. But, uh, but yeah, it always starts at the top, right? The, the model carries the most weight. And so if you have a leader, because this is notoriously what Rob and I talk about on this program all the time, like leadership 1.0, old school, command and control, power over rather than power within, right? Um, yeah, we know that that is housed by an insecure mindset. That is an insecure individual who's trying to control external things, events, situations, right? To hang on to their power because they're not actually confident in their true innate abilities, right? To be able to lead through whatever type of storm comes across their path because it always will, right? For leaders, we always say that too, it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that it's the power, right? That creates that intimidation, so to speak, right? And especially in this context, because we're talking about children, right? Like we're talking about kids who 
maybe have not yet found their voice, right? Or don't really have that sense of empowerment in terms of being able to bring something like this to the forefront. Um, what other factors do we see at play here in terms of this culture of silence? You had mentioned earlier, right, the idea of toxic culture. And I think this is maybe one of the challenges too, is that people are trying to separate like hockey as the sport, like stepping on the ice, playing, playing professionally, whatever that might be, uh -huh. from everything else that can fall into that umbrella of sport culture or uh -huh. the environment that being on that team creates, right? Uh -huh. And I think that's where some of these issues fall into play. And we've heard it, right? Like everything that's going on with Hockey Canada, it's like, oh, like, you know, it's a separate thing. Like, I just wanna watch hockey. I'm just here to see the boys play. And it's like, well, no, like, we know we've been athletes. Being a hockey player is not just about stepping on the ice and shooting a puck or passing. It's what is the environment in the in the dressing room, right? What are people saying? What are the social norms? What do you do as a group? What do you do to fit in? What do you do to stand out? And these are the things that really need to be addressed because it's not just about the game. And if there mm -hmm. are elements of this, right, that mm -hmm. are going on that have been perpetuated over time by the culture, mm -hmm. right, whether it's, you know, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but it's kind of, you know, seeing women as objects or mm -hmm. objectifying them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was like, like the objectification of women and how you relate with them and how you talk about them, like those things need to be addressed. So it's understanding hockey is not just playing hockey, mm -hmm. right? What's going on in the culture that we can make the sport better, not just for the people playing it, but for the world at large and everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's that's something we want to talk about, right? Because listen, we understand like teenage boys, they're pumping full of their bodies are surging with hormones, right? And then you sprinkle in a little bit of like your your community, right? Cheering you on and like standing around your games at the glass and just kind of worshiping you. We understand that when you take those boys and you send them to the OHL, for example, to play junior at 14 years old, away from their homes, away from their families, like, and yeah, they get put up with billets for sure. But I think for those of us behind the gates in this sport, we know the reality of that, right? Is that they're kind of they're not heavily supervised. They don't have a lot of mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then you add to the mix that they are going to a rink where they create that type of family experience with their, their buddies and their teammates away from home. That's That bonds them even more, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the cool thing to do in that locker room is brag about all the things that you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, that uh, obviously, because they're young, they're immature, they haven't had proper training on any of this from a mindset pr perspective or a behavioral perspective, mm -hmm. like they're boasting about that. And then it's getting reinforced. It's getting positively reinforced, right? Because yeah, the reception in the dress room, yeah, buddy, woo, <laughs> you're so, you're so bad. <laughs> like all of that is, I think what we're talking about, when we're talking about learned behavior, right? Yeah. Is like, not only is it largely being reinforced in the dressing room, but I think when you pair that with lack of strong leadership, education, and all of this that we're going to explore today, I think it explains, yeah, like just exactly how these types of situations are so likely to occur. Because we've only heard about 21 cases, and those are just the individuals who had enough courage to actually speak out in the face of all that fear, intimidation, and power um, abuse of power. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the stats one in three, uh, females will be sexually harassed in their lifetime. That's the stat, yep. right. I mm -hmm. think in, it's probably a bit higher in, in sports, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, when I, when I hear everyone like saying, and MJ talking about, you know, the objectification of women, especially, and we're not talking about just hockey in this sense, right? Like, I think this is pervasive in men in sport in general, mm -hmm. um, the misogyny, the locker room talk, right. That just screams old, old guys club, old boys club, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. And 
I know that as a female athlete, and I, I obviously haven't been in like a male athlete's locker room when it comes to like the beginning of the season conversations and the type of person that you're going to be on this team or whatever. Mm-hmm. But my experience as a female athlete is there is always a conversation of the fact that you are a representative of your community, mm-hmm. that you are a part of it and that you're almost a caretaker of it. Mm-hmm. it there's this sense of, you have a responsibility to show up in your community and to be a role model for that community in Mm -hmm. more ways than one. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that there's a part of that, that comes from this knowledge that we don't get to live out our sporting careers for our entire lives. And we don't get to make millions of dollars doing it. Mm -hmm. So while you're doing it, be a caretaker of the game and Mm -hmm. show up for your community because that's, what's expected. You know, we're women, we're nurturing all this kind of stuff. Right. Right get out in your community and do that Mm -hmm. and also play your sport. Mm -hmm. But I get the sense that for these guys, it's you're here to play hockey. The rest of the stuff, not too concerned about it. Show up at school. Don't get kicked out of school. Don't do anything super dumb, but Mm -hmm. you're here to play hockey. So show up and play hockey. Mm -hmm. And like, it doesn't work. I absolutely agree with that assessment, Lou. I think that that is spot on. Like, not only are we biologically speaking, maybe a little bit more the nurturers and a little bit more naturally empathetic, intuitive, the caretakers, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's like maybe a little bit more of a a female nature than a male. But, um, but I also think like that is the vast difference. I was always coming through my hockey career, knowing it was the vehicle, not the destination. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I was lucky that I had the ability to be under some pretty great leadership, right? Like when I was much younger coming up through the sport. um, Yeah. That were, I remember coaches that were really focused on developing me as a human being. Right. And like just helping us to develop a bigger picture perspective, right? In terms of the responsibilities that came with being a student athlete or being an athlete in in the community that was being looked at in some way, shape or form as, yeah, somebody that that little girls would look up to essentially. Mm -hmm. How about Taylor and MJ? Like, what, what do you think in terms of what else is going on here in terms of the culture of silence? Like, we're talking about learned behavior, right? And we're talking about some of this in and around um, how this type of behavior gets reinforced. But do you guys see anything else there that might be actually underneath the surface that's contributing to this? Because Taylor, I know I was listening to you on the show. And I know it was hard for you when you had a personal experience, right? It was really hard for you to feel like you could speak up. And that wasn't in a male dressing room. That was in a female dressing room, right? So let's slide the conversation in that direction a little bit, because it's not just on the male side, is it? No, absolutely. It's not just on the men's side, right? And I think it's at least in my experience and some of the girls that I know, it's, it's the inverse, right? Like it's not the players that are doing the sexual harassing, it's the coaches. And that's where things can get really, really difficult. Like, I mean, for me in in my scenario, um, I had just, I had just made this team, my first junior team. Um, so basically I'd gone from you know, not having any sort of uh, formal training, no personal trainer, no nothing. Uh, and then I got to have like a really great coach. I got access to um, like a, a professional goalie coach. I got personal training. I got everything all handed mm-hmm. to me at once. So like, mm-hmm. you know, the growth chart for that season was unreal for me. I was playing a lot. I was doing well. Everything was good. Um, but, you know, when I had first gotten to the team, I was able to get a new set of gear. And because this is like a whole new world to me, I was like, Hey, like goalie coach, you know, like, can you uh, just meet me at hockey life and kind of like help me out in terms of like picking something out for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Pretty innocent to me, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So everything was fine. Went there, helped me pick out the gear. And then uh, on, on my way home, I got a text from said goalie coach and it was, quote, I can't believe you don't put out on a first date. Oh boy. And he, keep in mind, like, he's like well over 30. He works with a, (sighs) a professional team in the NHL. And this is my first year on the team. So I was thinking like, that was like 
really inappropriate like but you know what like I'm just gonna laugh it off and just like forget about it like don't think about it anymore right and in hindsight looking back like that's such a dangerous thing for me to do but I was in this new place and I was doing well and I didn't want to have that taken away from me and I didn't Mm -hmm. want I didn't want anyone from the the coaching staff to feel like this this girl who's never been a part of this organization at all who just come in here Mm-hmm. comes in and starts to to kind of make ruffle way the feathers. And ruffle the feathers of of what's going on right so to me I was just like okay like just don't say anything like just don't 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 acknowledge it don't anything but like I said like looking back that was such a dangerous thing for me to do because there were days where I was at the rink at 6 a.m by myself working with this guy so any any number of things could have happened they didn't but they could have and, you know, this is kind of what I said earlier, like, it's so important to speak up because if it's happening to you, it's definitely happening to somebody else. And in this case, this particular individual actually ended up going to jail because he was caught sending inappropriate photos to minors. Not surprising there. And I think that's really, that's some of what to me is so upsetting about how long this has persisted. And why I think it's so important that we all take a stand and have a voice and really just encourage and empower other people to do so. So we can collectively break this code of silence, which we always say is silence is violence, right? Like this is absolutely, this is something I want to speak about too, because I think it's, um, it's, it's the shame too. That's something I really want to talk about, right? Because there's a lot of shame that comes with anybody who has been put in that type of situation. I'll speak for myself personally. I know um, I was sexually harassed by a coach. Um, It was during one of the most vulnerable times in my life. Um, Yeah, I just lost my father. I was away from home. I was, it was so complex for me because I was so grateful to be there and have this experience. And I even remember like considering like, I don't want to upset things for my teammates, right? Cause we're having a good season. And like, I just remember all these things that were like literally running through my filter as I was trying to decide like how I was going to deal with this all by myself. Cause I didn't even want to tell my mom, she just lost her husband for gosh sakes. Um, and so, yeah, I just think like, For me, when you have somebody who's in a position of power like that, and they do something like that, that is completely inappropriate, but you know, because of the culture of silence, that there's nothing that you can essentially do about it. Because I remember going to one of my teammates who noticed something was wrong with me. And and I told her and she said, well, yeah, he's had a sexual harassment uh, case against him before, but basically the organization made it go away. So there's really essentially no point in, in saying anything really. So there's even that, right. Where it's just like, because it's such a shared mindset in terms of that code of silence. Right. And I just think like, it can feel so impossible to speak up when you're a victim of that trauma, because you're, you're, you're so knee deep in your own shame too. Right. It can be really, really hard to speak up and have a voice and have the courage in the face of something that just feels like such a violation. And that's the thing, like, I don't, it's, 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 it's bugging me. (laughs) This is why I had to take a week to simmer down, right? Because obviously this hits close to home for all of us. I think we've all experienced this either firsthand or with our teammates navigating this type of situation. Um, But the fact that I'm reading through all of these articles and seeing all these interviews and listening to, you know, different accounts and different perspectives on this situation. I don't see anybody talking about that. I don't see anybody talking about the victims and the shame, right? That is at play when you are traumatized in that sort of a way. What are your thoughts on that, ladies? Like, I see that, I see all the reports about where the money went, right? Um, And I even see reports about, how the victim changed her story, <laughs> but I'm not seeing about like, where's the education in terms of the, the long-term consequences of allowing that type of 
silence to persist for as long as it has. What are your thoughts on this? The only thing that I have seen in terms of talking about the kind of like pushing, asking a, a victim to like kind of testify and go through that experience is, you know, having to, to relive that experience by talking about it all the time and that kind of stuff. The only thing in any of the articles I have seen has been one, and it was the reasoning that Hockey Canada had chosen to settle these outside of court. Mm-hmm. And that was their quote reason was so that the victim didn't have to relive that experience again, which really I think we can, yeah, which I think, you know what we can all kind of call BS on like, oh yeah, I think that's a really nice facade that you're putting up for everybody. But at the end of the day, I think everybody sees, sees through that. What do you see through in that? they're trying to they're trying to cover their asses right like that's that's really all they're trying to do like this is something they've been covering up for literally decades yeah so for them to you know say that they're being the hero in this situation by making sure that this person doesn't have to go through this experience again it's it's horseshit i think like these people have come forward for a reason well it's it's justice it's interesting because when i read her account, right? I read a statement from her this morning and she was actually saying, listen, I don't want to be in the media. I don't want to be front and center with all this. All I'm looking for and why I brought this forward to the authorities is for these people to be held accountable, for there to be some actual consequence to this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's what a victim wants, right? Is like for there to be, for that to be seen and for that to be known, because that's the other reality of this. Okay. Like, Let's dig into what we see in terms of the leadership here, right? Because obviously they're stuck in a very short-term perspective and they're making very short-term decisions based on that, right? Because they're trying to cover it up. They don't want to ruin the futures of these boys. They've got promising futures in the NHL and Team Canada and all of this, right, that they're trying to protect. But the long-term consequence of covering that up what do we see the long-term cost? We're all trauma experts, relatively speaking, in this room, right? I think that's been forced upon us. We talk about that with high achievers all the time. But, um, but what do we see in that, in terms of the leadership covering it up and what that actually leads to long-term? When we pick our head up and we actually start to see the ripple effect of everything that is connected to that one poor short-term decision. You've you've touched on it, right? Because in terms of the culture of silence as well, people have come forward, nothing has happened, right? They haven't gotten justice, people haven't been exposed. So like you said, in that situation, well, what's the point, right? Mm -hmm. So it only contributes that continuous culture of silence, because based on those behaviors in those moments, Mm -hmm. those victims think, what's the point? Because Mm -hmm. nothing's going to change. So you're Mm -hmm. perpetuating that. And then, so for the victims, there's that idea that, you know, my voice doesn't matter. If I say something, nothing's going to happen. There's nothing I can do. So there's that helplessness that comes from that. Mm -hmm. So on the flip side, like, I think it's interesting to consider how that culture even impacts the players long-term right Mm -hmm. you see players that when they retire like there is like heavy substance abuse they don't know how to live in society effectively outside of that toxic culture because reality is so different from what they've experienced Mm -hmm. so it impacts them it impacts their kids it impacts their families their friends and it's just like a big ball of shit that needs to be addressed really Mm -hmm. never mind the freaking nightmares that you have for years, if not a lifetime, after that sort of thing happens, speaking from, right, the victim's perspective, I think like PTSD that ensues from these types of episodes, Taylor, I know you could probably speak to that, right? Like it's, it haunts you. I remember waking up with nightmares for years after that, Mm -hmm. because I just couldn't reconcile, couldn't reconcile, couldn't reconcile. But inversely, it's interesting that you bring up that perspective because you know that that lives with those boys too. You know that they don't have tools or resources or anything, right? In terms of how to reconcile what it is that they have to live with because they made such a poor decision and nobody was there to counsel them through it. Mm -hmm. And so we know if we got 
both parties going out right into the future without any recognition of that or rehabilitation for that or support for that, we know what the ripple effect is into society because we counsel people in the chair every single day. High achievers are classically survivors of trauma, right? Like they're classically running on that self-work deficit, super compensating in all these ways that we're so passionate, right? And our thought leadership about addressing with high achievers. Mm -hmm. But we know that that ripple effects into society that affects the children of those people, right? Like it ensues, trauma goes down seven generations, folks, if you never get that type of intervention. Mm -hmm. But how about just in terms of, you know, like what we're talking about in terms of the ripple effect of how now this has affected our entire country's associations with our sport. I know for me as a mother, I wasn't that upset when Brooklyn decided she didn't want to play hockey. And I was at peace with that at the time. And I knew why, and maybe never really was vocal about it, but I'll be vocal about it now. Like, I know that our sport is not safe <laughs> psychologically, right? Not safe. And now we're looking at this from a physical standpoint. And that's the real damage that's been done, right? Is like the psychological safety. In, 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 in our line of work, when we get in locker rooms virtually, so to speak, with our leadership teams and such, we always talk about psych safety a lot because it really is the foundation to building a high performance team in athletics, in business, anywhere in a home, right? We say that it's high trust, low fear environments that cultivate the highest performing teams on the planet. So what happens when that becomes low trust, high fear? Are we really setting these young people up to realize their highest potential, not only in the sport, but as we're looking at in this conversation in life as well? That's the real issue here, right? And I know MJ, you had a little bit of the same thought process there. Like we're at, you're asking us to send our kids to you knowing that that type of decision making is at the helm. It's not safe. What are your thoughts on that, MJ? Yeah, I mean, I'm the parent of a 2 and 5-year-old boy and I love the sport of hockey. I'm so grateful for the opportunities it's afforded me, the friendships I've made. But absolutely, that's been a concern in the back of my mind. Like, I have no desire to force them or even encourage them to play unless they showed an interest, because that is my concern. It's that learned culture, learned behaviors. And, and like I said, it's cyclical, right? Like, let's say you make a travel team, you're a 15 year old, you know, you're on a junior team with 18, 19 year olds, you see them behaving and talking a certain way, like mm -hmm. the social norms and the pressures are there and you cater to them. And I think that's happened so many cycles over that 14, 15 year old then becomes the 19 year old and new ones come in. And I think some of them don't even know why they believe these things. Or oh, for sure. In this way, right? 100%. And that's, again, now being that I'm a woman who's gone through it and I have my own experiences with this stuff, right? But as a parent of boys, it just makes the issue that much more important to me in terms of being addressed because I love sports. I would love for them to participate in sports because of how much good it does for you. Mm -hmm. But that is absolutely an underlying fear of those negative maladaptive strategies and how those might stick with them beyond. So it's a balancing act, right? Mm -hmm. And it's well, I know, I know we all came out these gates really fired up about our experiences, right? Like, and in a lot of ways, it's what brought us to this work and to this mission is, is the fact that we had to survive the gauntlet, right? Of <laughs> trying to realize peak potential in unsafe conditions. And so that's why we're so passionate about getting back down into the grassroots and so passionate about working with the athletes, not when they're elite players getting funding, okay? But like, from the get-go, they need mindset training. They need to understand what's going on emotionally, how to regulate that. But also, they need training in terms of how to be able to navigate these types of situations, which clearly are happening to mm -hmm. all athletes, <laughs> right? But I think that's 
where my head went, right? When I was like, I think I'm okay right now with this decision. <laughs> it was her decision. And I was right there supporting her every step of the way in that little Timbits experience that lasted two weeks. But <laughs> I think I was okay because I, I, I knew in my head, I said, we still have so far to go, right? In terms of, because we don't have mental training for our young athletes. I'm looking at this action plan that Hockey Canada has released, and I want to go here next in terms of how they're going to tackle this issue and how they're going to make our sport safe again, right? And how they're going to restore trust in the, in the eyes of Canadians everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they're saying their plan is to get some education for the elite level hockey players. Can we riff on that for a second? Because I know I can tell by all of our body language right now, we're just like, for real? Like, do we still not understand the issue <laughs> and how the issue and the patterns of behavior and everything that we've been talking about in terms of that behavior being learned in locker rooms? Like, you got to get down to the grassroots. you got to start at the foundation of their little mindsets, right? And it can't just be a lip service video PSA that they got to watch after practice on the way out the damn door exhausted. Let's talk about this. Where do we actually think that they need to go to be able to get the sport that we love so much? Because we do. This, this is by no means a knock on our sport. We love hockey. It's what kept us in it fighting so long to get to that finish line. But what do we think as leadership experts needs to happen so that we can make our sport safe again and restore faith in the eyes and the hearts and the brains of Canadians everywhere? So I think one of the biggest uh, things I want to acknowledge right now to kind of take a couple steps back is that mm -hmm. one of the interesting parts about what's going on right now is I feel like the, the world and people who don't necessarily play hockey or are involved in the hockey community are now seeing something that a lot of female hockey players have known existed for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Like we've witnessed it. We felt unsupported by the organizations. We felt victimized by the organizations, right? So like we've known that it exists and now everybody else is seeing it mm -hmm. and ultimately that starts with the people that are in power positions mm -hmm. right so like when you have these people in power whether it's the coaches whether it's the boards of your minor hockey associations or the board of hockey canada itself that's where it needs to start yes of course we need to educate the players but they need to have the role models in place that are going to reinforce that training Speak because on if it. we train them we train these players and then they look up to the people that are leading them, their coaches, the managers, whoever. And they say, well, you know what? The, the messaging I'm getting from what they're doing eh, just kind of tells me that that training I took was just lip service. It's good. I'm good. I took it. Check it off. It mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's a matter of like, how do we teach these people that their actions and their behaviors have an impact? Mm -hmm. right? These kids are looking at you and whether they're kids or they're young adults, it doesn't matter. They look to you for leadership. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one of even my own experience happened while I was a coach at a camp. Oh gosh. And it's like, what is like, you even have it with coaches who are doing it to other coaches. Like that's mm -hmm. not okay either. Mm -hmm. So I think it starts, I think it starts with the people that have the most impact on the players themselves, not necessarily with the players. It's, it's, yes, it's important to, to train the players and educate them, mm -hmm. but why are we leaving the coaches out of this? Because well, it's crazy to me that it, we talk about this all the time in our leadership locker rooms, right? Our leadership launchpad locker rooms, um, the average leader in corporate doesn't even get leadership training till 46 years old. And listen, those are like, you know, that's big business. Mm -hmm. Where, MJ, I'll ask you, because you were a coach for over a decade in our sport. So where does that leadership training go down for our coaches? There is nothing other than the <gasps> certification you need which, <laughs> which we all know is a point of topic for me like well, when, yeah we've all done it we've all done the like 
what is that online that you do that you barely have to pay attention to multiple choice because it's all uh, like common sense yeah so i have my high performance one designation so That's i need that to coach the university and the junior levels mm -hmm. but still that it's like how do you draw practice you know how <laughs> to plan a season and it's like it's these leadership elements right that people are not trained on and even the leadership training when people get at 46 isn't necessarily addressing the key issues for building a good culture right like mm -hmm. giving and getting feedback how to recognize the contributions of other people how to create psychological safety like that's not how to write a performance review it's like those tangible interpersonal relationship elements mm -hmm. that everyone needs to understand how to function effectively within those combines, right? So it's, it's the people managing the organization, it's the coaches, it's the support staff, it's the players, it's the parents, like have clear expectations. Like this is our moral code of conduct. Mm -hmm. If you are in this culture, like if you're in this fish tank, you have to live by these rules or mm -hmm. else you remove from the fish tank. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Everyone wants to point a finger and be like, oh, like the players need that or, oh, like mm -hmm. the president needs this. It's like everyone needs to be in agreement and everyone needs to understand what's expected and be held to those standards with consequence. Right. That's the key. There needs to be alignment all the way from the top down to the grassroots, the very first Tim Bits freaking skate. <laughs> yes. Alignment, right? Like we're all on the same page in terms of what really matters, right? It's like, I was thinking about this the other day. Can you imagine if this were a principal or a teacher that we were hearing about in the news and that the school board was paying off all these victims of sexual abuse in the school system with our sending our kids to school in those conditions, parents would be losing their minds. But what's the difference? what is the difference we're calling one a sport the other one's a school so maybe it's like more obviously like developing the whole little human <laughs> to a good you know healthy contributing member of society there would be an uprising right and i know that those teachers get this type of training maybe not as much as we believe should be taking place but certainly more than athletic coaches are getting mm -hmm. So I think that that's a really, really great point. I love it, Lou. Like the model carries the most weight. It's always what we discipline our leaders to believe is true because it is true. And so what do we think of the models here, right? Because I think we've seen an action plan. Brenda Moore has stepped down as the chair of the mm -hmm. Hockey Canada board. Um, what was the quote that he used that I loved so much? Because I kind of feel like he, he, he's the one in the bunch I see that really gets this. He gets that this, that we need to clean house, that we need to start fresh, fresh, clean slate of ice folks. Right. <laughs> what was the quote, Lou? You, you had it a second ago there. Yeah. He said, there is no need to wait for a new era. Immediate action is essential to address the important challenges facing our organization and our sport. I love it. And, and I love it because he gets it. There is no time to waste. We got a lot of work to do. If this were a corporate space, we'd be looking, you know, like when we talk about culture change, that takes years, right? It's like a really, really, really deep and thorough exercise that needs to take place. But even from a psychological safety standpoint, right? Like I know um, Scott Smith, who is the current CEO of Hockey Canada, he's taken an opposite stance, right? Where he said, I've been in hockey my whole life and I'm not giving up on my sport and I wanna make sure that these changes are made. What do we think about that, ladies? Quite contrasting <laughs> in terms of the stance that these two leaders are taking. It's like, yeah. it's like he's got he's he's hiding beneath a veneer of trying to look like a 2.0 leader yeah like, but it's not it's not working number one because like we said earlier before we hopped on the call it's you've broken trust and there isn't enough time for you to try and rebuild it we don't have five generations of kids to wait mm -hmm. for you to figure it out you've mm -hmm. been in the position long enough and you've made this decision multiple times so you clearly don't get that it's wrong in the first mm -hmm. place. The only thing that's happened is now you've gotten caught. 
Uh Actions speak louder than words every day of the week. And if you're going to sit here and try to act like you're trying to hold yourself accountable after making the wrong decisions, not just once, not accidentally making a little mistake, you've made a big mistake multiple times. And now you're trying to kind of kind of frame yourself as being like this, this great leader doesn't really work that way. Yeah. That's the problem I see, right. Is like, it was your decision-making not once, not twice, but all these times that we're looking at. So I think that's the accountability these victims want to see, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's the consequence we need to see to know that this organization actually gets what the real issue is and is taking it seriously and claiming that responsibility. Well, and I know we're talking about like Hockey Canada specifically, but it like, it really does go not just like within the Hockey Canada, uh, like framework, but it needs to go across the provincial frameworks as well, because I don't know if, if anybody has read, but, um, Hockey Manitoba's head has actually stepped up and backed hockey what Canada. What the heck was that guy's that, interview all about? I did read that this morning. Yeah. I don't know, but it, it blows my mind because he's sitting here saying that he believes that they have the right people leading the organization. I read They've that, got a yeah. great deal of experience in the hockey world and that he's comfortable with the direction that they're going in now. Yeah. When the action plan that they've put out has a lot of gaps in it. And we know that that's just something that they've tossed together as a reaction yes to everybody kind of bringing down the hammer on them and holding them accountable for what they've done yeah 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 I think it just again it just speaks volumes right because he obviously is still not understanding the change that needs to happen that's what I see in trying to hang on to that position of power right it's like he's not actually understanding that we can't trust that decision making anytime soon, because this type of situation we're talking about in terms of these unconscious biases, right? Like it takes time. It takes time to work that to the surface and reprogram that and recondition that. And yeah, I just think like, that's why I, we need to see, we need to see them clean house. Okay. The, the other thing I see in this is like, yeah, he, he's saying, oh, I trust I trust our leadership. They've been in the hockey world forever. But that's also part of the problem is the homogeny, right? Mm -hmm. Like this old boys club, as everybody's calling it in the media, um, which, which makes sense, right? Like old boys club. It's basically like a lot of ex hockey players, right? Because notoriously in, in the, on the guy's side, like they stay in the game, right? They become coaches, they become scouts, they become, right? Leaders of different organizations. And so it's basically just that, that locker room (laughs) experience that's perpetuated all the way to the Mm. top in terms of the people that are at the helm. And that's not to say that we don't need some representation there, right? From the actual boys, I guess, in that circumstance that they're serving. But how about the whole other side of our sport? Where are the females on that leadership board? Where's the diversity in terms of different ethnicities? Because we're not just all white people playing this sport anymore. It's 2022. And in fact, we are on a mission to grow our sport worldwide. We're like actively engaged in that mission, right? But that's the other problem I see (laughs) that's not really being spoken about or addressed. Well, and that's something I think that really drives me crazy about this whole situation is the fact that, okay, like this has happened because of this like, old boys club this type of toxic culture that's been you know created within the sport but unfortunately it's not really the men's hockey team that's seeing a huge like kind of fallout as a result if that makes sense because like yeah because it's it's the federal government that's pulled the funding from hockey canada but most of that funding goes towards their women's program that's how they're able to play and compete and and you know, centralize like a full year before going into the Olympic cycles, right? Like that's Mm -hmm. what blows my mind through and through about this whole scenario. Because the consequence is still not being applied in the right direction, which also shows that the leadership is a little lost in the sauce still. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, luckily we're seeing a lot, a lot more social consciousness on behalf of businesses that are in partnership and sponsoring the, the Hockey Canada programs who have started to pull out now, especially that since like 
the outcry from public has been like, you need to make a stance here. Like you have to pull out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the only big difference outside of that is, you know, the fans have also been impacted by this too. Like they have reduced the cost of world junior tickets right now to try to fill the stadiums Mm -hmm. because nobody wants to go and support it right now. Mm -hmm. That's, that's some of that long-term consequence that I just feel like was neglected because of that short-term perspective, right? And trying to cover it up in that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and in terms of our girls, I know we were talking about this earlier, Lou, like what, what's going on in terms of them right now? Because they're obviously the ones that are being most impacted by this financial uh, withdrawal, so to speak, from our federal government. And then- yeah the sponsorship mm-hmm. money itself. But um, I thought that was very odd too, right? Like the fact that they came out good on them with the unified statement, right? In terms of what was it that they said? You got the quote in front of you, right, Lou? Yeah. So, I mean, just to clarify too, if you're not familiar with how the funding works within sports, um, I think there's a, there's a stat from Caroline at Goal Sports, who we just interviewed on um, Inside the Athletic Mind, and it's less than 1% of sponsorship money goes to female sports. So like when we're talking about uh, companies that sponsor Hockey Canada, Mm -hmm. you can reasonably assume that not a whole lot of that is going to the women's side of things. Mm -hmm. What the female team gets funded by is government funding. So they've now pulled the government funding and we're asking for increased pull of that corporate funding because the majority of that was going to the men's sports mm-hmm. um and like taylor was saying you know like it's it's the the men's teams that are perpetuating this kind of behavior and the women's teams that are getting held accountable at least monetarily mm-hmm. for it right because mm-hmm. they're now seeing the fallout from it mm-hmm. but they put out a joint statement um and in one of one of the line says they intend to be vanguards for our great game and the only way to treat an injury is to acknowledge it fully so they're stepping up and saying like we all we want to be part of the system that brings all of this to light that acknowledges all of the issues that are happening because you can't treat an injury if you don't fully acknowledge the source of it mm-hmm. And they're also saying that they want to be the ones who are stepping up and protecting the game that they love and protecting the people that are a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Like, I absolutely love it. But the one thing I don't love is they put out the statement and we haven't heard anything else from them. So my mind goes to where's the gag order? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Like, I I don't don't think any of us can expect that that's going to change overnight. It's been Mm -hmm. like we're talking about today. It's been such a long history of silence. Right. Um, But I do think, yeah, I think that that's that's amazing. I think that's why we're on this show right now riffing on these these mics. Right. Is because we we're passionate about this. stuff. We want we want to see our freaking sport make a comeback. And make a comeback in a 2.0 way, right? Stronger, better, faster, realizing more of our potential. And that's what we've been talking about on this show ever since we launched it at the start of this pandemic, right? Adversity is just the opportunity for growth dressed up and disguised as adversity. So this disruption in my, this is where I land with it, is in my opinion, is not a bad thing. I think that's what the last two years has been for so many leaders, right? Is like this has really, this last two years has really shooken all those cracks in our leadership foundations, right? Um, loose. And now we're bringing all of that darkness to the light. It's being exposed. And to me, that's amazing because the awareness comes before the intelligence, as we say here at Team Elite, right? You can't solve it until you acknowledge it. So let's land this plane, ladies. Let's talk about our recommendations, our call in terms of what we feel needs to happen, right? So that we can capitalize on this disruption and take our sport where it needs to be, right? In 2022, what do we feel like needs to be the call? MJ, I'll start with you. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, like I said, I heard on the radio the other day, there was a development camp for a professional team uh, and someone was doing consent training with all the athletes that were there. They were asked, how many of you have done it previously? And two hands went up. They were both NCAA players. It was probably mandatory through their school. I do think that is a part of the solution. Again, you said awareness comes before intelligence. If, if these boys aren't aware mm -hmm. of what consent is and what it looks like and, and, you know, the guidelines that they should be following, the intelligence may not be there. So I do think that is one tangible thing that can be mandated mm -hmm. to help, to help in this issue in particular. Love it. Taylor, how about you? I mean, we've been riffing on this the whole time, right? It starts from the top down. And right now in the leadership roles, we're not seeing the leadership that needs to be there. And if it's the same people that have perpetuated all the violence that's gone on mm -hmm. over the past couple of decades, we can only assume that that same culture of silence and fear and power is going to continue forward. So I'm thinking we definitely need to get some more diverse and 2.0 leaders in those chairs instead of the ones we have in there now. Love it. How about you, Lou? I'm, I'm going to go back to the discussion on the, the old boys club, because mm -hmm. I think that the promotion of this idea that, you know, if you're a, an elite level male hockey player, you, you your shit doesn't stink, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can do whatever you want. You're going to make millions of dollars playing this game. You are not held responsible Mm -hmm. or accountable for your actions outside of the rink because you are here to play hockey mm -hmm. it doesn't work mm -mm. right like we said it has consequences for even even the guys that it does work for while they're playing mm -hmm. but it also leaves out a whole crap load of guys that don't get to make millions of dollars playing the sport mm -hmm. right it promotes a very select few of people and it helps a select few people mm -hmm. and i think that we need to clean slate of that like get that culture out. And like we said earlier, bring in some more diversity of thought, bring in more experience. We don't just need the, the guys that have made it to the top level of their sport, making decisions for everybody mm -hmm. who, by the way, the majority of them are never going to make it to that top level because mm -hmm. less than, less than what is it? 1%, less than 1%. 1%. Makes it. Mm -hmm. Right. So we don't need an entire board of the 1% making decisions for the 99%. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So I'd like yeah. to see mental, some, some mental health experts on that board, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like for an example, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think we need to have different expertise and I think we need to have expertise from outside our sport for sure. Right. Because I think like that is the, the whole reason why DEI training is tearing its way through big corporate right now right because of all the stats and all the research and and around how the diversity of thought is what leads to innovation right and what leads to the best types of problem solving and leads to again high performance so that's where i think i want to land my call is just i think it needs to really prioritize like safety I think that that needs to start at the top, obviously. We got to get leaders up there, role modeling exactly what that looks like to have, you know, the capacity to see and hear your people and create that safe condition where people feel empowered to speak up about what's working and what's not working and why. And then I think we need to infiltrate that all the way down to the Timbits at the grassroots, right? I think obviously, like we were riffing on today, we got to get our coaches leadership training. My gosh, the responsibility that they hold at the front of that locker room and the impact that we all know those coaches have on our self-concept, on our self-esteem, on our beliefs about what we're capable of our beliefs about what matters and what's important as whole, you know, heart-centric human beings. I'd like to see that happen. And I'd like to see our kids empowered with a lot of that same mindset training too, right? It's why we combine mindset training with leadership training and call it leadership 2.0. Because our kids, they're the ones that really, they need the opportunity to understand how to have a voice and speak up 
and contribute so that they can too be a part of bringing our sport where it needs to be, right? Where everybody's happy and healthy and safe because yeah, that is going to create that high trust, low fear condition that leads scientifically speaking to the highest performing teams on the planet. But it's also going to help with this mission that we're on here too, right? Dream team, we're here to change the way the game is being played forever. So we need everybody in alignment with that. We need you listening to be in alignment with that. We need all of you out there to be speaking up and having a voice about this stuff. You see how hard it is for our women's national team right now. But for you out there in the community who are obviously being affected by this too, we all love huddling around our TV Saturday to what Saturday night to watch hockey night in Canada. We all love cheering for big red at the Olympics, right? Like this is high stakes for us too. And so we all have to have a voice and come to this table and contribute our ideas in terms of what we feel needs to happen, right? So that we can restore the pride that we have in our national pastime. So that's, that's it. That's all. I feel like we could continue this conversation for days. In fact, maybe we'll do another one further down the line once we see how this all, this whole thing shakes out and evolves. But um, thank you so much, Dream Team, for having the courage to get on this mic and share your stories and having that voice and contributing to um, the solution that we all need to see here with this. Any final words from you all? Might be an exhausting journey, but it's a necessary one, right? MJ, you got any words of inspiration for our peeps out there in the audience? I think it's just about having people who dare to have a vision for a different future than mm. how it's always been, right? And I think the challenge is we have a lot of leaders whose vision is really just a flashback and it's mm -hmm. perpetuated over time. So embrace the idea of a new picture for something that's better not something that has been i love it call the courage from mj taylor i think i'll stick with the courage aspect here but from a different angle you know like if anything has happened to you if you know somebody that's something or if they've had had to experience something or if you're somebody who's in a position of of leadership and you know that something isn't right it's really important to take the time to speak up Amen, sister. And for me, my, my call is to Hockey Canada. Mm -hmm. Your highest potential is our passion. So let's unleash it together. Like, come find us. If you want some of this <laughs> contribution to what you all are trying to do over there, um, we obviously want to throw everything we got in our expertise at this and, and be a part of the solution. But um, just to drop a resource for, for anybody out there who's listening, who knows anybody who's been affected by sexual assault, um, there is a hotline number that you can call, right, Taylor? Lou, did you have that number? Um, no, I think you had it, Susan. <laughs> I know, I did have it. And then I went to pull it up and then all of a sudden... Let's I pull could... it up. Let's pull it up. I know, it sits here somewhere. Hold yeah. on. All right, well, I'm going to have to get Rob to pack it down to the end because my phone's not working on the spot when I need it to. But, uh, mm -hmm. but please, if you guys know anybody out there who is struggling or suffering or just even lacking that courage to have that voice and needing somebody in their corner, right? To, to help them, to bring that to somebody that can help them and the resource that can support them through that. Please, please, please be a champion, whether it's in a locker room or it's in a corporate office or it's anywhere in your community, please, please, please help that person out um, and lead them to the right resource. Uh, that's it. That's all. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to the Leadership Launchpad. If you like this episode, share it with a friend, share it with a colleague, share it with a sibling, share it with a leader that you feel like really needs to, to hear what we had to say today. And of course, if you have anything else to contribute to this conversation, don't hesitate to come reach out and find any of our fabulous coaches here at the Dream Team. Uh, the elite dream team. We're all very passionate about this subject, as you can tell. So 
do us a favor, follow along, drop us a line and let us know what you thought of this conversation. Um, until next time, your highest potential is our passion, right, ladies? Without a doubt. Hey, we'll absolutely. see you on the we'll see you on the next episode.